session where we will be having a very important discussion on reemerging infectious diseases with the spotlight on diphtheria outbreak. We are all aware that we are having a large outbreak within the country. So we have two erudite speakers for today's session. We have Dr. Muzamil Gadania, who is the Deputy Incident Manager for the National Diphtheria Emergency Operation Center with the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. And we also have Dr. Philip Oshun, a consultant clinical microbiologist at the Department of Medical Microbiology and Parasitology, Lagos University Teaching Hospital. So I will please crave our indulgence. Let's give a few more minutes for us to have more participants and then we'll kick off the presentation. But Dr. Philip Oshun will be giving us the first presentation, then he'll be followed by Dr. Muzamil Gadania. Once again, you're welcome to today's session, and I hope we have very robust discussions, especially concerning the ongoing outbreak in our country. So thank you all. Over for now. Apart from uh, our local participant, we have somebody in from India, and I think she's Rachel Satram. She's on this call, um, and she's going to have the recording of this session when we are done. So, admin, kindly note, you need to send the recording to Echo India. You are welcomed once again. Uh, how long are we waiting for? It's already we're already seven minutes into our time. How many more minutes? Dr. Jura Nejembi. Okay, Dr. Oshun. So Dr. Oshun. Yes. Good morning. Are you ready to come on? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, like, all right. So good afternoon once again. So since we have Nosta. Hello. Yes. Uh, Dr. John, uh, we're waiting for him. Uh, Lekon, I hope you are letting him share his screen. Dr. Philip Oshun is a consultant clinical microbiologist at the Lagos University Teaching Hospital, Nigeria. So Dr. Oshun, you have the stage. You can go on. Good afternoon, everyone. So today, um, the topic is reimagining infectious diseases with spotlight on the diphtheria outbreak in Nigeria. So the question is really, what are reimagining infectious diseases? So um, as the name sounds, they, they must have been in existence and now uh, they are reappearing due to some reasons. So there are diseases that reappear after they have been on a have been on a significant decline. I mean, um, diseases that we thought we were winning, and for some reasons uh, we begin to have problems with such diseases. So they constitute significant health problems in a particular geographical area during a previous time period. Then the, the prevalence or the incidence declines substantially or um, significantly. Then for some reasons, they become public health uh, problems of major importance. So that's what we imagine diseases, are, infectious diseases are. So they reemerge due to breakdown in public health measures or diseases that were 
once under control. So diseases that we had uh, been able to reduce the incidence uh, substantially or significantly based on public health measures. And for some reasons, um, this decline uh, begins to rise. So the incidence and the prevalence be begin to rise or there are outbreaks in some areas around the world. So um, they could also be due to new strains of diseases. Uh, for example, antimicrobial resistant bacteria. We know that there are new strains of different diseases that are um, emerging. So we call them also re-emerging diseases. So why does this disease or this infectious disease re-emerge? Many reasons might be most, like we mentioned, usually due to breakdown in uh, public health measures. Um, conflicts, when there are lots of, when there are um, security challenges, insecurity, wars, um, different conflicts, then people are displaced and um, that uh, gives room or gives rise to um, breakdown in public health measures and then there could be a resurgence of disease. Then migration. So people who mig migrate from endemic areas to non-endemic areas can also import. So, so, ex so to, it should it be import, export the disease to some other areas where the diseases are not endemic. Wildlife consumption and travel. Um, there's a lot of traveling, that's globalization. Um, a lot of traveling occurring now. So the next city is just a uh, flight away. So a lot of global travel, and that also leads to um, reimagine pathogens. Uh, urbanization, overpopulation, um, like I mentioned, antimicrobial resistance in humans and um, livestock. So those are many reasons why these um, reimagine infectious diseases occur. So can we have some examples? Um, of course, our spotlight today is diphtheria. That's why it's uh, the number one. And the contributing factors for these is a breakdown in public health measure, which is interruption of uh, vaccination or immunization. There's malaria, um, there's anti-malaria resistance, resistance to anti-malaria drugs, uh, favorable conditions for mosquitoes vectors. So those are the things that are uh, causing malaria to re-emerge. Tuberculosis, uh, because of uh, HIV AIDS, there's a resurgence uh, in the incidence of tuberculosis and also due to anti antibiotic resistance. We know there's uh, multi-drug resistance and there's um, extensive drug resistance, XDR, for tuberculosis. Yellow fever also uh, because of urbanization uh, and interruption also of immunization. Uh, we know that there was, out, there was an outbreak around, uh, was it 2017? Uh, because of interruption of um, immunization. That was an outbreak of yellow fever around 2017 and 2018. Measles, uh, also vaccination, and pertussis, uh, which is whooping cough, uh, also due to breakdown in vac vaccination. So we can see that um, many of these diseases are due to breakdown in public health measures, um, antibiotic resistance, and um, inadequate vector control. So let's um, discuss diphtheria, which is um, the reimagined disease that is um, very uh, important to us right now. Uh, Dr. Muzami will be discussing about the outbreak, so I'll just give us um, an introduction to diphtheria, and we'll discuss the infection control measures at the healthcare facility level. So it's a it's a, it's a disease of public health importance. Um, I inter has become a significant problem because of poor routine vaccination coverage. Um, after the establishment of the expanded program on immunization in 1974, one of the vaccine preventable diseases was um, diphtheria and um, vaccine was made against diphtheria 
And what happened later was that there was um, a significant reduction of um, in terms of the reported cases. Um, and we can see a large, over 90% reduction due to the um, success of vaccination um, based on the ex expanded program on immunization, which uh, WHO introduced in the 70s. And uh, Nigeria was also a beneficiary. And I mean, I know we started with EPI, that expanded program on immunization before uh, in the 80s or was it in the 90s that we now renamed it National Program on Immunization, MPI, which is what the program is right now. So why the emergence? So uh, we know that uh, there was a multiple indicator cluster survey on, uh, on National Immunization Survey in 2021. And one of the results was that the third dose of pentavalent vaccine, which includes the DPT, um, H influenza B virus um, vaccine, and also the uh, hepatitis B virus vaccine. So that um, pen the pentavalent vaccine three as a third dose, the coverage was just about 57%. So you can see that um, a large population of, um, that's just those who received the third dose, not, not necessarily that they completed first, second, and third, uh, but that was the indicator that was used, the third dose coverage. So, and we had about 43% unvaccinated. Uh, we don't know how many even received the first and second um, doses. So that shows us that um, there's been interruption um, for va with vaccination. So, but to ensure community protection or herd immunity, we need vaccine coverage to be 80 to 85% uh, to ensure that there's herd immunity to protect even the unimmunized. And what uh, could have led to this? A lot of insecurity challenges. Um, um, security ch insecurity challenges would uh, disturb vaccine accessibility um, and that will lead to suboptimal coverage right? because access um, to care becomes more difficult. A lot of uh, people have become displaced uh, in, in um, IDP camps. Uh, some can't even leave their houses. Some can't even go to their farms to farm. So there's a lot of, because of this insecurity, um, coverage of vaccine has been reduced considerably. And so these are factors that have led to this reemergence of um, diphtheria. And that has contributed greatly to this outbreak that has started since last year. So what uh, what, what is the causative agent? So Corynebacterium diphtheria, uh, which is a gram-positive bacilli. So these are bacteria that are gram-positive, um, non-spore forming. The other, so the main um, causative agent is Corynebacterium diphtheriae, which has humans as the natural host. But there's two other Corynebacterium that may also cause um, infection, and that is, may also cause disease. Corynebacterium ulcerans and Corynebacterium pseudotuberculosis, which are uh, zoonotic, that means they are transmitted from animals to humans and their natural reservoir would be in animals like goats, sheep, dogs. Um, the major virulence determinant or the virulence factor for C. diphtheria is the um, diphtheria toxin. So is the actually the toxigenic Corynebacterium diphtheria that we are really worried about because it's a toxin that mediates um, all the um, features that we see for um, diphtheria. So it is important that at the end of the day, the when this organism is isolated in the lab, must be able to confirm whether it is toxin producing or non-toxin producing. So it's a toxigenic uh, or toxin producing coriny bacterium that we are actually interested in. How is the disease transmitted? Um, incubation period two to five days uh, may range from one to 10 days. 
So it's transmitted by close contacts and um, through infected uh, respiratory droplets from coughing and sneezing. And for those, for the animal to human uh, um, ingestion of contaminated raw milk uh, for Corynebacterium ulcerans. So the main route of transmission is by direct contact and also through infected respiratory droplets from coughing and sneezing. Uh, of course, the sources of infection will be respiratory droplets or discharges from the pharynx, from the nose, and also because um, the there's cutaneous diphtheria, that means diphtheria can also affect the skin. So it can also spread from the skin and occasionally the conjunctiva um, for cutaneous diphtheria. But the main um, one is the respiratory diphtheria, which is the one that causes um, the significant mor morbidity and mortality. So a person can be infectious as long as the bacteria are present in the respiratory secretions, which can last about two weeks without treatment and sometimes last longer than that, especially for the convalescent who continues to be a carrier for some time. So there can be asymptomatic carriage. So there are carriers um, of this potentially toxigenic corine bacterium um, it can occur during the incubation period and also after convalescence or even in healthy individuals. So the, the period for carriage can be as long as six weeks to six months in some individuals. And you can see in areas, countries where diphtheria is endemic, about three to 5% of healthy persons may carry the organism in their nasal pharynx. So the disease is respiratory diphtheria or cutaneous diphtheria. And for respiratory, the most common would be, um, the, it affects the nose, the pharynx, and the larynx. But the pharyngeal diphtheria is the most common presentation. The patient will present with mild fever with exudative pharyngitis. That means um, uh, production of pus uh, initially over two to three days. Then the exudates sometimes are able to organize to become pseudomembrane. And that pseudomembrane forms in the pharynx or in the larynx as the case may be. The pseudomembrane is typically grayish in color and is firmly attached to the underlying tissue. And also there could be enlargement of uh, the cervical lymph nodes and sometimes also edema. And that is what uh, gives the characteristic bull neck appearance, uh, the enlargement of the cervical nodes and edema around the uh, pharynx. So the pharyngeal diphtheria, fever, with um, exudative pharyngitis, uh, which progresses to formation of a pseudomembrane uh, that is firmly attached to the pharynx. And the cutaneous diphtheria, usually more common in warmer or tropical climates, and especially in settings where there's poor hygiene and overcrowding. And we find them a lot, we find them more commonly in chronic non healing lesions, usually lesions that are with may have refused to heal. Uh, we, we may suspect that um, uh, it could be due to uh, cutaneous diphtheria. So that's um, uh, a differential diagnosis for chronic non-healing lesions. So they um, present as ulcers, uh, non-healing ulcers on the limbs. So apart from the respiratory symptoms, the toxin also enters into the bloodstream and can lead to myocarditis, inflammation of the nervous system or the kidney, and also bleeding dietesis uh, due to decreased platelet counts. And of course, complications can result in abnormal heart rate because of myocarditis, um, the nerve paralysis because of inflammation of the nerves, encephalitis, pneumonia, uh, sub, subacute sclerosis, pan encephalitis. Uh, these are complications that could occur much later. So when the patient presents, so there's a case definition um, 
in the clinical case definition, a suspected case is any person with an illness of the upper respiratory tract. So I mean, this person is coughing, sneezing, and has a sore throat. Mm -hmm. And then that's, we make a diagnosis of pharyngitis or nasopharyngitis or tonsillitis or laryngitis, plus an adherent pseudomembrane. So that's the case definition for a suspected case of diphtheria. So for you to say someone is a suspected case of diphtheria, then the patient must present with a pharyngitis, a tonsillitis, laryngitis, and an adherent pseudomembrane. Then when samples are sent to the lab and there's a culture of a toxigenic corinibacterium species, then we say it is laboratory confirmed. Take note, it is a toxigenic corinibacterium uh, diphtheria that uh, makes it laboratory confirmed, not just culturally, the corinibacterium diphtheria. We need to test, go ahead and test for production of toxins and there are uh, laboratory tests to do that uh, to check whether the organism isolated produces toxins or not. Um, samples, you collect some, the oropharyngeal and um, NASA swabs, so two samples uh, in, and you send them together in a transport medium. And uh, you can see the, the, what we mean by a transport medium here, the swab and the transport medium come together. So you use the swab to take, to swab the nasal, nasal, nasal swab and also oropharyngeal swab and you put inside the, this, um, what you call the um, transport medium. As much as you can, collect samples before commencement of antibiotic therapy. If for any reason therapy has started because you don't want to delay therapy, still collect the sample after uh, commencement. But please take note that on the um, laboratory request form. Send the samples immediately as soon as you can. As long as it's in the transport, you can send it within 24 hours because we know that um, some um, hospitals may be far away from laboratories where these tests can be done because it's not all laboratories that can do these tests. If a pseudomembrane is uh, present, then you need a specialist to collect this specimen, uh, to collect it from underneath the pseudomembrane. If you must touch the pseudomembrane, then make sure a specialist is uh, there to do that, either a pediatrician or uh, infectious disease specialist or um, ENT surgeons. So this is the um, flow chart for, w, for NCDC. So you collect a specimen, uh, send the culture. So we culture on blood agar, telluride agar, or sometimes Tinsdale agar. Uh, we subculture onto blood agar, we do a gram stain, we see gram positive rods uh, that look like Chinese letters. And we do some tests to uh, confirm and for laboratories that cannot do these tests, once they isolate the organism, they can send to the National Reference Lab in Abuja. And of course, for everyone that isolates the organism, we still send to the National Reference Lab where the toxin test, the test for the toxin is done. Um, so for now, it's the National Reference Lab that does the toxin testing to determine whether it's toxigenic or non-toxigenic. Treatment, antibiotics, and um, um, diphtheria and toxin. Uh, we'll not discuss so much about the treatment. Um, so how do we prevent the disease? Sorry, I think this, let's look at this slide first. So there's a diphtheria toxoid, which is an inactivated toxin uh, that is adsorbed onto an adjuvant. So it's a safe and effective vaccine. And usually, the toxoid is not given alone, it's given in combination with other um, vaccines. At first it was with DPT, so it was a trivalent vaccine, and now it's, um, it penta it's part of the pentavalent vaccine, so that the child does not need to take many injections. Um, this is usually given as an 0.5 mil dose intramuscular injection, 
stored at two to two to eight degrees, not frozen. And to test for immunity, test whether uh, someone who has been vaccinated has become immunized. So the difference between immunization and vaccination is that vaccination is the act of giving the vaccine. Immunization is when the immunity sets in. So how do we know that someone is immune to diphtheria? We need to do some tests to collect blood sample to check for the diphtheria antibody levels. And it should be greater than 0.1 international units per meal will confer full protection. But we know that the full protection is not, uh, does not last forever. So when it is one, more than 1.0, then that gives a long-term pro uh, protection. And so what is the schedule? Uh, based on many countries have different schedules. The guidance from the World Health Organization at six weeks, um, then 14 weeks for the pentavalent vaccine. Then the first booster dose. So there needs to be booster dose because it's the, like I said, the vaccine is not um, for life. So you need to give booster doses. Um, 12 to 23 months, then that's the first booster dose. The second booster dose at four to seven years and the third booster dose at nine to 15 years. Uh, so that's the uh, schedule um, as advised by the World Health Organization. So let, let us look at the IPC considerations for um, diphtheria. Uh, first is to look at standard precautions. I'm sure we all know this. So do we just go through um, hand hygiene, very important because we said it is close, the transmission is close contact and also respiratory droplets. So uh, personal protective equipment, um, especially during uh, during sample collection and also during uh, when we give care at the health care facility. Then because it's also uh, spread by contact, um, that means uh, there could be indirect contact from um, formites and um, equipment and uh, uh, the equipment within the patient's zone. So environmental cleaning and disinfection will be very important for this and also cough etiquette because people who cough should be able to cover their mouth when they cough, cough into a tissue and drop it into a bean. Um, and hygiene, I'm sure we all know this. So we would um, go through that um, five, um, very important rules for hand hygiene that hand hygiene at the healthcare facility should be performed at the point of care. We should prefer hand drop uh, using alcohol hand drop uh, than um, using soap and water because it's faster, more effective, and better tolerated. And most importantly, it can be done at the point of care. You uh, hand washing with soap and water when there's visible death or um, expo following visible exposure to blood or body fluids. Indication for hand hygiene is based on five moments of hand hygiene and their uh, appropriate techniques and time duration for hand hygiene. And we'll see the five moments, which is moment one is before touching a patient. Uh, so clean your hands, uh, practice hand hygiene before uh, touching a patient. Moment two, before clean a septic procedure, uh, that means before any procedure, do hand, uh, perform hand hygiene. Then yeah, most likely you would wear a pair of gloves because you are doing a clean or a septic procedure. And of course, this would include um, uh, changing uh, urethra catheter or urethra catheterization um, procedures like wound dressing would fall under this. Then after body fluid exposure risk, clean your hands also. That's performance hygiene once this procedure has been completed. 
to remove gloves and perform hand hygiene. Um, moment four, once you finished with the patient and you touch the patient, then you should do hand hygiene. So if you are going to the patient bedside to palpate or to do vital signs, then you should do moment four. And the last one is when you go into the patient's environment or point of care, but you do not touch the patient, but you interact with the patient environment, you touch the, the bedside cabinet, the bed, the drip stand, then you should do hand hygiene. So that's moment five, after touching patient's surroundings. And then um, hand wash should be at least, should be between 40 to 60 seconds hand rub 20 to 30 seconds. And these are the different um, uh, steps. Hand wash or hand rub. And for those doing sample collection, uh, you must use personal protective equipment to ensure that you do not get um, infected while collecting the specimen. So gloves, mask, um, gown and apron, goggles, and if goggles are not available, face shield. Those are where when collecting uh, the specimen. Proceed from cleaner to dead sea areas. So treatment room before the wards, wards before the toilets, uninfected bay before infected bay. Uh, that principle is very important. I can see how we move, look at this diagram, move from clean to dirty. The other uh, principle is that you should um, do the cleaning uh, in a systematic manner. So, so that you don't miss areas. So you can do it left to right or clockwise as the case may be. So follow a pattern to ensure that, and you can see this is the one for cleaning the floor and this is the one for cleaning the surfaces. So follow a particular pattern. You can do clockwise, you can do left to right, um, do it in a step-by-step -step method. The other principle is that you proceed from high to low, not as top to bottom. Uh, so that you don't prevent dirt from falling from top. So if you start from bottom and you go to the top, from dirt may drip or fall down to the bottom. So always start from the top to the bottom uh, when cleaning. The floor should be the last to clean, of course, because the things that you've cleaned off from the um, top would always fall to the ground. So the principle of Cleaning and disinfection is that you clean with soap and water first before you disinfect with a disinfectant. Always ensure that spills of blood or body fluids are cleaned immediately and use fresh cleaning cloths at the start of each session. You change the cloths, um, that's the cleaning cloths, uh, when they are and wet them and make sure you do not do double dipping. That means that once you put the cloth in a bowl, you don't put that cloth back. So you finish using that cloth, dis you discard that and take another one. So always change cleaning cloths between patient zone. Uh, the other thing is also to do screening and tri triage to ensure that those who have upper risk, those who are coughing, are cohorted and taken to some other areas so that and of course, offer them masks to wear, um, have um, tissue paper for them to cough in and um, waste bin to uh, throw it in. Then there should be isolation area. And that's what we will discuss next. For those who have been confirmed or those who are suspected, we need to practice transmission-based precautions. So we need to uh, put them in isolation, isolation-based precaution. And for uh, diphtheria to be contact and droplets. So transmission-based precaution can be contact-based precaution, can be uh, droplets or airborne. So there are three different uh, categories. But well, for diphtheria, because we mentioned that it can be spread by direct contact and also by respiratory droplets. So we need to ensure that we practice 
you combine contact and droplet precaution. And when you place a patient on contact and droplet precaution, you need to put a signage or a poster to indicate the isolation precaution area. So we need to uh, let everyone know that this is the area for isolation precaution. Um, the patient in a single room, if available, in the same room. So all you know in a single room. Then the healthcare workers who are attending to these patients must wear surgical mask, face shield, or goggles, gloves. Or apron uh, to attend to the patients. Or apron, because it's um, then the surgical mask and face shield for the um, droplet precaution. The PPE should be upon room entry and to ensure that the PPEs are discarded before exiting the room uh, so that you do not take out um, the pathogen. So it must discard before leaving the room. And of course, hand hygiene, very important. So hand hygiene and the PPE that are needed to ensure for patient care in the isolation room. Then for the patient care equipment, uh, use disposable or dedicated patient care equipment. That is the standard. Um, if for any reason you need to share, uh, then you must uh, clean it and disinfect in between, especially for uh, the ones that are non-critical uh, patient care equipment. Non-critical patient care equipment can disinfect in between use, uh, for example, blood pressure, cough, the uh, pulse oximeter, and so on. So environmental cleaning and disinfection is very important. We discussed how that can be done earlier. So that should be done at least once daily, uh, depending on the policy in the healthcare facility. So the disinfection should focus on the um, eye touch surfaces. And of course, most especially the equipment in the immediate vicinity of the patient. So uh, cleaning and disinfection because it is uh, transmitted by direct contact. So that's for contact precaution. And of course, you need to, the um, healthcare worker needs to wear mask and um, goggles uh, for the droplet uh, precaution. Because the droplet can go into the eyes and into the uh, mouth or nose. So you need to cover with mask and goggles or face shield. Um, as much as possible, limit transport or movement of patients. Uh, but if patients need to be uh, moved for some procedures or for um, radiology or for some tests, then patients should wear a surgical mask to, uh, for source control. You need to notify the units before going so that the, um, the members of the unit can be prepared so that you use um, very little time in that um, unit. And of course, they, are also, they also wear their PPE when attending to the patient. The trans transport in an ambulance or bed or wheelchair as the case may be. And the healthcare worker who is transporting the patient must also wear the appropriate PPE. So that's very important. So as much as possible, limit patient transport. But if we need to, then make sure the patient wears a surgical mask. So that's um, for the contact and isolation precaution. And so this just shows, these are the kind of um, posters or signage that will be at the door uh, or at, 
in, the, in front of the ward when the doctor or the healthcare worker goes in to see the patient. So these are reminders. And of course, it also reminds those who are around to show them that this is an isolation area and um, there is no, it's only for those who have business there that should go in. And when going, when going in, the healthcare worker should do hand hygiene, wear the PPE and then go in. And when coming out, all the PPE must be discarded uh, before leaving uh, the room, except the mask, which because the healthcare worker needs to go out of the room with the mask, except the mask for um, droplet precaution. So in summary, uh, we've discussed um, diphtheria as a reimagined disease. Uh, we've discussed the causative agent, which is bacterium diphtheria, producing toxins. And we've discussed how to collect samples, the case definition, and most importantly, when the patient presents at the healthcare facility, how do we prevent uh, infection uh, at the healthcare facility. So infection prevention and control measures. Standard precaution we've mentioned, um, and hygiene, environmental cleaning and disinfection, use of PPE and cough etiquette. And most importantly, patients need to be isolated using the contact and, and um, droplet-based transmission precaution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Oshu. That was a wonderful, brilliant, and lucid presentation. <laughs> I harassed Oshu to send me citations. So that is why I forgot to mention that he's a seasoned IPC professional, but you can see that he came out at first in his presentation. This, can we show him our reactions? It was a wonderful one, taking us through each area. And very importantly, the important IPC consideration, the role of environmental cleaning, the role of transmission-based precaution. Thank you so much, Dr. Shun. That was wonderful. Please, I'll ask us to keep our questions while I call on our second presenter, please, Dr. Muzamil Gadania, Deputy Incident Manager for Victoria for the National Bacteria Emergency Operation Center at the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. This is Dr. Muzamil. You are welcome. Will you be sharing your slides or you want us to share your slides for you? Dr. Muzamil, can on mute. Hey, Dr. Muzamil. Okay, it's asking us for a few minutes. You know, they are very busy at the emergency operation center. We actually have currently having an outbreak ongoing. So let me check the chat box and see if there are any questions or comments from our first presentation. Or is there anybody that wants to unmute and say something? Dr. Shun has taken us through all that we need to know as healthcare professionals and IPC practitioners when it comes to managing patients with bacteria. Okay, he says he's having network challenges. So some of the important points Dr. Oshun took us through, he talked about 
why diphtheria is a re-emerging infectious disease. We had it under control. As a medical student, I never saw a case of diphtheria. It was a, it was a textbook disease to us then. And then as a resident, I only came across a single case. And that time, it was in a family where they had a history of vaccine hesitancy. They had, they, they were not vaccinating their children. So that was the only case of the I had seen before the current ongoing um, outbreak. So you can imagine now we are having so many cases occurring across the country. So he mentioned very importantly that in 2021, it was found out that coverage for third dose of the vaccine was 57%. And you can imagine how populous a country or a nation we are. Our third dose for the pentavalent vaccine in 2021 was 57%. And for us to achieve herd immunity, we need a minimum of at least 80% vaccine coverage. And we also know that, as he mentioned, vaccination does not immediately equate immunity. Vaccination is one thing, the body's immune response, ensuring that the person is now immune to the disease is another. Then he very importantly also mentioned the cost through the rudiments of environmental cleaning. How we should not dip and clean. So I'm sure he refreshed our memories with that. And then how we need to implement transmission-based precautions to ensure that we do not cause outbreaks within the healthcare facilities. We need to implement both contacts and droplet precautions. And he really took us step by step on the components of contacts and droplet precautions. Dr. Muzamil, are we good? There is a hand up, Dr. Okay. John. Uh, Sally Sue, Okay. Um, Madam, Sally Sue Inua, you can please unmute and yes, speak. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you so much. Actually, you know, you were saying there was a question. I wanted to ask a question to Dr. Osu. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir, for this uh, presentation. Actually, quite apt. Uh, my own concern is, uh, you see, largely, you hardly see uh, more of nosocomial transmission of diphtheria because uh, I'm, I'm even part of the uh, technical working group here in Kano, but we hardly recorded a case of diphtheria among healthcare workers, even with the way our poor infection control is. And then at the same time, uh, major of community, I don't know whether sir, you can put um, uh, more point of measures of IPC at the community level, because that has been a challenge. I don't know whether is it a compliance or is it that we don't have much measures to put in place. Uh, we have this challenge here in Kano, definitely, that people are not, though we have a, a lot of risk factors of being overcrowding and whatever, but the measures, the basic measures in the community that people should be taking at the facility level is easy to comply with the majors, but unfortunately at the level of community it's quite difficult for most of the people. That's why uh, uh, more of the cases are coming, really. Thank you, sir. I hope my tech is understood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you are for that um, very, very, very important question. He is the IPC focal person at Amino County Teaching Hospital. So I can understand how it's a problem for him. Dr. Oshun, please, are you still with us? If you can respond to Mr. Inua's concerns. Yes, um, I think you should remember that diphtheria is a vaccine preventable disease. And like I mentioned, there's also the factor of immunity. If you are immune, then you're not likely to, even if um, there's transmission, then you're not likely to come down with the disease because that's what the vaccine is for anyway. So we'd want to imagine that most of your healthcare workers have uh, full protection. Maybe they had vaccination when they were children and they received their full vaccination, but it is possible for diphtheria to be spread in the hospital. And it's very clear because it's a 
it's a contagious, very contagious um, disease. Uh, so we must adopt uh, the healthcare, sorry. And remember, it's not just about the healthcare worker, disease can also be transmitted to patients. So when we discuss healthcare associated infection, It's not just the healthcare but, um, always be um, may not always lead to disease. Uh, so there could be an uh, invasion and multiplication and multiplication of um, microorganisms, but no tissue damage, and that have mild infection. Uh, so those are the things to consider. But it is important to follow these IPC principles. The, for the community, the main reason why people are getting infected is that there's no vaccine coverage. So no matter what, there's very little you can do at the, not little, at the community level, uh, people are overcrowded. These people are in the rural communities. These are people who have issues with poor hygiene, which are all, these are all the risk factors. Uh, which are very present in those communities. But if they can be immunized, they vaccinated, and they have good immunity, then no matter what happens, they, they are not likely to come down with the infection, even if there's overcrowding. So that's why the main uh, public health measure for this disease is the vaccination. And it's a disease that we have conquered over how many years that is resurging. And we know why this is happening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shun. So, Mr. Inua, you can see, just as he said, it's a vaccine preventable disease. So, one thing that can be done in the community now is to ensure that people get those who are at risk are vaccinated so they can be protected because it is it will be difficult to adhere to controlling the spread in the community without the vaccine. The vaccine is the first line of defense in this case and that was why as i mentioned during training as a medical student we never saw cases of diphtheria but now we have a resurgence because as i said in 20, 2021 our coverage was 57 percent when we need at least 80 percent for head immunity um dr shun there's another question for you here in the chat Thank you again for the presentation, Dr. Shun. Please, how long is the long-term effects of the vaccination for those that achieved immunization? Apologies, Dr. Shun, are you still with us? We'll be having internet problems. Okay. Well, you know, we don't know if Dr. Muzabin is ready. Otherwise, uh, if mm -hmm. he's, is he ready? So that we can take it at the end. Or if he's not ready, we can continue with the discussion. Uh, okay, I think okay. he's up okay. now. Okay. Okay. So we note that and take it at the end. Um, Dr. Muzam, um, Daniel, I can see your hand up. Let's see whether Dr. Muzam is ready for us first. Yeah, you can entertain the so, questions. Oh, I'm here, ma. It's like they are, they are, Muzam is still busy in the EOC. So, Daniel, let's hear your concerns. Uh, apologies, this please. Is... Um, and uh, I am fully committed to this course now. It's a directive okay. given by the DG to deliver this. So I, I will have to. Thank you. I'm here. So uh, am I required to put on my camera or something? Or would you pardon me uh, uh, to, to, to do it without the camera? No, it's OK. As long as you can see your slides. Are you sharing? Are we sharing from our end? Oh, I could share. You could share. Either one works Which with me. Which do you prefer? Let me do it. You are, the, you are my king now. Your wish is my command. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's a good one. <laughs> so after your presentation, I go come away. Where are we? Or oh, is the meeting with the state team? Where? Yeah. 
Yes, so uh, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. loud and clear. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me start by appreciating uh, the leadership of the Nigeria Society for Information. Led by our able uh, godmother and uh, grandmother, uh, Dr. Showandi. Thank you very much, ma'am, for all the good work you continue to do and engagements that uh, you continue to churn out uh, together with the team. And of course, I must appreciate also uh, uh, the great work done by uh, Dr. HMB and uh, uh, her team, uh, ably supported by uh, our able Lekon, who is uh, always on ground to make things work. So thank you very much. And uh, the NCDC is appreciative of this opportunity to be on this platform providing this update uh, as the agency that is taxed with the mandate of prevention, detection, and response of uh, infectious diseases. So um, I, I, I know you all are experts, uh, be it in IPC, be it in case management and uh, surveillance, but uh, uh, very importantly, I, I felt the need to start with some context, and uh, this would have been covered in the previous presentation. So I will uh, just delve into uh, it very briefly and then get to the situation report part where we will take some time to interact. So uh, as you do know, it's, uh, diphtheria is an acute toxic infection caused by the bacterium, uh, coronobacterium species, uh, primarily a problem of the respiratory tract, but may also go on to uh, affect uh, some other places on the body. Uh, it could be uh, cutaneous. Uh, this this just uh, reminds me of a story. Uh, last week, we had uh, the pleasure of hosting colleagues from uh, our, the Robert Koch Institute in uh, Berlin. And uh, when I told him that uh, I'm the deputy incident manager for uh, a diphtheria outbreak, and this is what we are facing currently in country, he said, wow, is it a cutaneous diphtheria? I said, no. And then you could almost see the, the shock on his face, like, uh, the, the, this is a vaccine preventable disease. So why do we still have this problem in this part? But of course it's multidimensional. And then if you begin to uh, you know, uh, analyze that, you will have enough reasons to uh, fill books and stuff. So, um, but certainly we can do better. I think uh, uh, we can do better than having diphtheria outbreaks. So it's almost like a, uh, unfortunate that we are actually having to go through this despite the availability of uh, uh, proven effective uh, vaccines. So uh, most infections are the uh, are caused by the toxin producing uh, C. diphtheria and uh, rarely some other strains, which I am sure the uh, clinical microbiologists before me uh, must have done uh, justice uh, to that. So regarding the transmission, humans are the only natural host for the C. diphtheria uh, with uh, 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 carriers as reservoirs. And uh, also transmission can be direct person to person through respiratory droplets, indirectly uh, through uh, contact uh, with skin lesions or contaminated clothing. So uh, linen management is very important here as I'm sure it has been discussed uh, in the previous presentation. Uh, transmission can occur as long as the transgenic bacteria are present and in discharge lesions, uh, uh, which is normally two weeks or less. So, um, uh, but sometimes it could extend up to four weeks and then antibiotic therapy, uh, largely macrolides, can promptly terminate shading of this bacteria. And this can happen as early as uh, uh, 48 hours to 72 hours after standing this, uh, starting this antimicrobial therapy, you could achieve uh, that result. So as far as the symptomatology is concerned, the incubation period is uh, average of two to five days, but it could be as high as 10 days. And uh, it, it typically starts with uh, all of the things that I mentioned here, fever, sore throat, and then uh, on examination, you see the uh, adherence pseudomembrane. And then uh, also it could uh, uh, proceed to have a uh, uh, you know, uh, difficulty in breathing, and then uh, the bull neck appearance and presentation. And uh, complications could actually uh, be multi-systemic, you know, uh, 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 depending on uh, the level of toxin production and then where the uh, target organs are as far as the uh, uh, deposits of the toxins are concerned. And then that could be as high as 10%, that's CFR, in outbreaks and higher in settings with diphtheria antitoxin is available. And again, this is... Uh, 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 sort of our circumstance. We won't say we don't have it, but we say there is paucity of it. Uh, from case management perspective in this regard, uh, if um, 
maybe a case of diphtheria does come with bull neck. At the minimum, you would expect that uh, they should get like uh, five vials of, uh, 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 you know, the DAT or 10 vials even in some uh, uh, circumstance. Uh, in Kano, we have seen 12 vials given, you know, uh, but importantly, you may not have the luxury to give that particular patient that is presenting before you uh, the full complement of these 10 or 12 vials as uh, the guidelines uh, do require. So you are limited by that sort of. And diagnosis is uh, 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 very straightforward. Two samples should be collected from every suspected case at first contact with the case, pharyngeal swab uh, and nasal swab. A specimen should be ideally taken before antibiotic therapy. Uh, that is also part of standard practice. But it doesn't mean that uh, if you see a case uh, uh, that you should wait until uh, you collect sample before you commence some management. I'm sure as clinicians, you know better uh, to not do that. And then a whole standard for confirming diphtheria is by culture of the organism uh, from the specimen and demonstrating toxin uh, production, uh, which is the modified ELEC test in this regard. And uh, how we do that at the, uh, uh, across uh, Nigeria is um, largely across uh, states, we have uh, uh, the first capacity. Uh, to do primary culture. But then uh, as far as the ELEC test is concerned, that has to be done at the uh, National Reference Lab in uh, Gadua. Uh, PCR done to detect the presence of uh, AOD subunits uh, of the diphtheria uh, antitoxin. Sorry, uh, not the diphtheria antitoxin, the diphtheria toxin gene, the toxin at the DAT is the mainstay of treatment actually, either given IM or IV and uh, antibiotic therapy uh, ideally after sample collection. Uh, what we see from our current national AST pattern is that uh, there is a very good uh, sensitivity uh -huh. uh, pattern for erythromycin and azithromycin. Uh, certainly these two top the chart and the uh, penicillins are sort of uh, a thing of the past. So apologies, I will certainly update that in my slide. Uh, isolation of cases and association of uh, or completion of immunization. So it's a tap actually, like we just finished discussing now uh, with some few stakeholders. Uh, the tap is that uh, we keep having cases because we have this uh, short of uh, shortage or gap to close regarding uh, vaccination coverage and also uh, uh, you know access to vaccination uh, so that we can have the required immunity for this not to happen. So, so long we continue to have that gap, uh, whatever you do in case management, in lab, in uh, uh, surveillance, you're only reacting to the problem. So the main problem is to ensure that you close that up. And I can uh, testify on this platform that uh, all efforts have been done by uh, uh, the co-agencies uh, of DG and CDC and ED and PHCDA to ensure that uh, uh, the necessary strategic support is provided uh, by the uh, two agencies to the states and facilities to contain this, to contain this ongoing outbreak. Uh, management of contacts is an important uh, uh, also modality because you have paucity of vaccines. So if you have paucity of vaccines, uh, you as much as possible make sure that uh, all your contacts are like, listed and then you monitor them. And then you also start them on the azithromycin or erythromycin uh, for a period of uh, 10 to 14 days. So that is very important. And then you regularly call them up, you know, to check on how they are doing. So that is part of standard, just like COVID. So this is like the global situation of what has been happening uh, regarding diphtheria. So for us, uh, you can argue that uh, uh, it's, it's a new problem if you're in that school of thought, or you argue that it's an existing problem that has been there. What we have now is an improved surveillance system that continues to pick it up. So uh, be it as it may, uh, we certainly uh, give more credence to the latter part of the discussion. Uh, before API began in 19. 77, about one in one million cases of diphtheria and 50,000 to 60,000 deaths uh, occur globally set up. Uh, but then uh, the burden of diphtheria has since decreased since uh, the launch of uh, uh, first the DPT and then subsequently the pentavalent vaccine. So uh, as far as the distribution is concerned also, you can see Africa is somewhere with the thick, uh, darker, uh, blacker uh, trend uh, line and then uh, you can see some other regions uh, certainly but in Europe the important thing to see here is that uh, uh, as far back as uh, uh, 19 uh, uh, late in the 90s I think they stopped seeing some of this things. and then even around that time they're mostly seen around Eastern Europe uh, in uh, those uh, countries 
And then uh, also Southeast Asia, I think uh, certainly together with uh, 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 Eastern Mediterranean, we continue to uh, face the burden of this problem. So uh, the blue, the black and the yellow continue to be at the problem as shown here. And then this is also another typical presentation of how uh, the picture has been uh, prior to now, uh, 1974 to 2021. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we haven't had uh, as much uh, sudden improvement in terms of our surveillance system as we currently do have now. Uh, certainly we have SOMAS deployed in 774 LGS across Nigeria. It then means when these cases present at healthcare facilities, uh, the, the LGA DSNO can be alerted and you can come and certainly do case investigation and then fill the case for uh, CIF for that uh, uh, particular case and then it will be seen in real time uh, at the NCDC. So we do have that luxury. And I think uh, uh, it's something to also put on this uh, uh, platform. Uh, if you do peruse the literature across all the academic databases, you see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you see many studies done uh, uh, across the world, largely in some uh, parts of uh, uh, East, uh, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you know, uh, some, some part of Africa as well. But then you see that uh, the studies for this part of Nigeria or for this part of uh, uh, Africa uh, in Nigeria, they are sort of limited. So there is the need to ensure that uh, also we uh, certainly uh, do the needful in terms of closing that uh, knowledge gap. Uh, what you see here also, you lastly see uh, things around case report or cases a particular paper was written just about a single case that was uh, reported in that regard. So um, this is this is an improvement as far as we are concerned. You know, we have uh, this uh, uh, outbreak ongoing, so it's an opportunity for us to learn a few things and then also close the knowledge gap, uh, see how we can also contribute to the knowledge uh, repository uh, across the world. So summary of the study findings is that diphtheria is still prevalent in the country, uh, in Nigeria, and then uh, uh, there is paucity of studies, but we need to close that gap. Poor vaccination against diphtheria is the major driver, actually. Suboptimal capacity at the subnational level is a problem. Uh, limited access to DAT uh, as the mainstay of treatment, uh, you cannot afford not to vaccinate and then afford also not to have the DAT. So it's almost like a double edged sword that is happening now. And the known availability of standard surveillance with uh, the current uh, uh, diphtheria response guideline that was uh, recently uh, sort of developed by the NCDC and our uh, colleagues uh, from also the subnational level. Majorly gaps in vaccination policies and guidelines. And part of what we just finished talking about now uh, is that uh, you have uh, some, some, some policy level challenges uh, regarding uh, some of the vaccination problems. Uh, prior to now, Penta can only be given, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, not older than 23 months of age. Uh, any child that is older than 23 month of, uh, months in terms of age, they may not be eligible for Penta. But then with all that is happening, the vaccination policy and guidelines had to be updated. So now you can give it for as long as up to four years. Uh, for Penta, and then thereafter you start the, the TD. So uh, what we have is an ongoing system, which is guided by the IDSR technical guidelines uh, to ensure that we uh, get timely reports of uh, uh, all of the public events that happen. And then uh, uh, this is also a public document that has been in existence for quite some time. And I'm sure uh, most of you on this call do know uh, at the IDSR guideline. It entails that uh, timely dissemination of result information for effective uh, uh, appropriate action at that level, be it LGA, be it state, uh, be it national, essential for planning, implementation, evaluation of public health practices. You know, data is the new oil, it guides everything you do. So whatever you are getting in surveillance, it needs to inform your risk communication activities. It also needs to inform how you uh, uh, engage with uh, stakeholders. And then case management data also should be something that inform how you also uh, uh, do RCCE going forward. Yeah, so um, as far as the core functions of the system are concerned, uh, they revolve around these uh, uh, cyclical changes. Uh, you identify, you report, you analyze, and then you prepare or you respond at that regard, uh, at that level, and then you communicate 
And then whatever you do is uh, it's a never ending cycle. It's a PDSA cycle sort of. So you continue to ensure that uh, you improve and then you uh, contain uh, or continue to make efforts in that regard to ensure that you are able to contain the outbreak. So for the national reporting uh, uh, system, So for the national reporting system, I think uh, some guide is provided here uh, where it starts from community, community-based surveillance, uh, get to healthcare facility, that's the expectation. Every case that is uh, sort of adequately mobilized at the community level, it should have some link. Yes, thank you. So uh, after that, you get to the state level, which at uh, that level, you have the state epidemiologist, and then some level of primary culture, like I mentioned, can happen, or even diagnosis in some regard, it can happen at that level. Uh, but if it's not uh, possible, it then escalates to the level of the uh, uh, National Reference Laboratory. So um, I think uh, it's also important, I think, uh, to, to just reiterate some of these things. Uh, 45 priority diseases in the country, 25 are uh, uh, for immediate reporting, uh, 11 are for weekly aggregate reporting, and then nine are for monthly uh, aggregate reporting. So I won't bother you with uh, much of that. But uh, delving into the meat of the matter, uh, specifically here uh, is the surveillance case definition. This is actually not a, not a picture from some country or a textbook or Google, no. This is a picture from Kano, and it was taken uh, by the NCDC during uh, some active cases that, that happened in Ungogo LGA. So these are live pictures. These are real people. Real, these are real Nigerians, you know, that continue to face this outbreak that we are talking about. Uh, so the suspected case definition is that any person with illness of the respiratory tract, upper respiratory tract, uh, that presents in the uh, inotypities or laryngitis. And then importantly, there is the adherent pseudomembrane. So that is when you begin to uh, say this is a suspected case. So uh, as far as the community case definition is concerned, just anybody with sore throat, let them refer them to the healthcare facility. And when they do that, uh, the level of the healthcare facility, the healthcare worker can then ap apply this uh, surveillance case definition and then uh, see whether uh, the case meets the case definition for it to be classified. A suspected case. So a confirmed case is uh, a person with a uh, uh, coronavirus species uh, isolated by culture and positive for toxin production, regardless of symptom or knowledge. So whether you have symptom or not, once this is uh, certainly documented, then you are uh, regarded as a confirmed case. And then uh, there are also some uh, entities around uh, how we also do final classification. So final classification as far as uh, the uh, surveillance system is concerned, uh, it's around three entities. There is the lab confirmed, there is the epi linked, and then there is the clinically compatible. So the lab confirmed, a person with uh, coronabacterium species isolated by culture and positive photosynthesis production, like I mentioned earlier. And then the epi link cases, a person meets this definition of a suspected case and is linked to ep epidemiologically to a lab confirmed case. So you have the typical symptomatology as shown in the suspected case, and then you also have had, uh, you know, uh, some uh, epidemiological linkage in terms of uh, being a contact uh, of a lab confirmed case. And then a clinically compatible case, uh, a suspected case that lacks both confirmatory uh, lab result and epi linkage uh, to a lab confirmed. So uh, most of the cases actually that we currently see here in Nigeria uh, during this current outbreak is largely around uh, the clinical compatibility because oh, okay. the oh. testing for uh, confirmation uh, is limited. It's not widely available. It can only be done at the NRL. No, I was not informed. Yeah, so uh, discarded cases uh, in this regard, a suspected case that meets either of these criteria, coronavirus species, but negative elect test, and then uh, O, uh, or uh, negative PCR for the toxin, as uh, it was discussed earlier. So these are the cases that you see that are called discarded. And you see this as we go during the course of the uh, 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 discussion. So on the 1st of December in 2022, uh, the That's NCDC, if you suspected diphtheria outbreak in uh, Kano and Lagos, 
uh, largely it comes, uh, it came from our colleagues at Luth and uh, AKTH together with Murtala Mohammed Specialist Hospital in Canada. And then uh, following that uh, uh, information, RRTs were deployed to both states uh, on the 12th of December to confirm the outbreak and then support response activities. And then uh, thereafter, the third outbreak uh, were confirmed, uh, uh, was confirmed in those states. And then um, uh, most states also became uh, involved in reporting cases and then uh, response activities as I've seen been done uh, to support some of them as highlighted in this uh, slide. So a total of uh, uh, 10,200 suspected cases were reported from 31 states of 209 LGS uh, as at AP week 36. And uh, uh, Kano continued to lead the chase in this regard uh, with 7,651 cases, followed by Yobi, 1,157, and then uh, Kasina, Bauchi, Borno, Kaduna. Uh, these two states, or oh, these six states or thereabout, uh, if you lump them up, uh, they account for 97% of the cases that are actually seen. So uh, it then uh, tells you the burden of the problem. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, if you look at it, you see that the lab confirmed a few, and that is uh, a testament to some of what I have uh, alluded to in terms of challenges and uh, limitation at the subnational level. The AP linkage is 117, but the clinically compatible uh, is the one that continues to actually provide the needed guidance in terms of uh, classifying these cases uh, in the end. So uh, this is the EPICOP that shows uh, uh, the distribution of these cases uh, across uh, <clears throat> the AP weeks as shown here. And uh, you can see also the classification of these cases uh, is done. And uh, you can uh, further tie to uh, tie what is shown here in this picture to what I earlier mentioned in the discussion, that clinical compatibility is the one that continues to guide what we do as far as uh, these uh, discussions are concerned. So uh, we, we still have the discarded, they are the gray colored and then the uh, unknown. So those ones are the ones we are evaluating for other respiratory diseases, uh, typically like COVID-19. Yeah, so uh, also CFR among confirmed cases uh, from AP week 19 to uh, AP week 36. Uh, so you can see following the introduction of DAT, uh, somehow we happen to have a, 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 you know, a decline in number number of uh, 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 the uh, mortality. So the CFR uh, currently starts uh, at uh, 335, and uh, that is uh, equivalent to 5.5%. And uh, certainly we continue to uh, notice, uh, you know, some, some decline, especially in uh, the high burden states, uh, largely uh, Kaduna, Bauchi, uh, Borno, and uh, certainly Yobi also. Uh, but uh, it's kind of that we need uh, a more concerted effort in seeing that uh, we are able to also uh, 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 take the uh, or improve the case management outcomes uh, at that level. Uh, incidence by state age sex distribution, uh, so AP week 36. So you can see here, based on the incident rate, uh, uh, the state that are deeply colored in the, the red, which is Kano, continues to be the epicenter here. And then uh, that is followed by the uh, slightly uh, less reddish color. Apologies, I'm not very good with colors, but I just know that spectrum of red or pink or orange, as the case may be, I shall know orange in that work. So uh, those uh, uh, in the orange class, uh, 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 Borno and Casena, they sort of have the same incident rate reported in that regard, uh, but uh, others uh, uh, that are in the pink sort of uh, class, you can see we have Lagos, Ocean State, Imo, Enugu, Cross River and some others. So, but certainly the, the higher the degree of the red, the more uh, severity in terms of uh, this number of cases. And then the excess distribution also tries to show you the uh, burden of the problem that we are currently facing. Uh, certainly what we see at the national level is two to 14 years. Uh, that's the bulk of the problem. Well, that's where the bulk of the problem is. So we are uh, sort of paying for the uh, 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 sins of the past. So uh, immunization gaps that haven't been closed uh, or that haven't been done uh, in years uh, leading up to five years, 10 years uh, are the things uh, that we are paying for currently. And then you can see that um, certainly as you look at the age sex distribution also, uh, for women uh, that are age uh, uh, 19 or 15 and above, 
you see that the, the, the density or the body in terms of the number is higher compared to their male counterparts. And also that can be attributed to uh, the fact that uh, mostly uh, women are the carers of uh, children, uh, which are the dominant age group in this regard. Uh, so it's for that reason that you can uh, uh, be able to establish some level of uh, relationship between the uh, cases you see among uh, women who are carers of these children and uh, uh, compared to the men in that regard. Yeah, so uh, as far as the vaccination picture is concerned, um, you can see uh, the different uh, aggregation here or disaggregation. Uh, the red represents unvaccinated, uh, yellow is partially vaccinated, and then green is fully vaccinated. Uh, in some subsequent slides, you will also see uh, some things that will allude to this data. So only 3,618, that is 23.4%, out of the 6,000, and 72 confirmed cases were fully vaccinated, you know, and uh, with bacteria toxin containing vaccine. Majority, that is 73.1 of the confirmed cases uh, occur among the age group of one to 14, and they are actually uh, zero dose. So that is uh, adequately shown in, in this uh, slide uh, based on that. And then uh, regarding also uh, the PENTA vaccination coverage, uh, so from the a uh, mixed survey that was done uh, in 2021. Uh, you can see national progress towards a uh, uh, global vaccine uh, uh, action plan uh, goals. Uh, Penta 3 coverage uh, was that, uh, you know, we should have 90%, but then we are at 57% uh, nationally and states with greater than 80% of, uh, uh, of uh, Penta 3 coverage are actually just 19 so you can see that also pictorially represented here. Uh, those in green are the ones that have the greater than 80% uh, uh, coverage of Penta 3. And then uh, uh, that's in this uh, uh, one on my right hand side. And then the ones in yellow is 50 to 80%. And then the red are the ones that have the less than 50% uh, in terms of Penta 3 uh, coverage. And then uh, also, uh, if you look at the Penta 1, also you see uh, greater than uh, 80% uh, of the Penta 1, uh, uh, you know, coverage uh, largely in the southern part of the country. And then uh, the less than 50% uh, and the intermediate is somehow uh, spread across uh, the northern part and some uh, north central states. Yeah. So uh, also, again, uh, in terms of zero protection, uh, for one to have this... Uh, this. For one to have zero protection, they are required to have... Uh, uh, you know, uh, antibodies greater than or equals to 0 0.1 international unit uh, per mil and uh, by age and state. So uh, from the NICE data, we were able to go back and then uh, sort out for this uh, a specific uh, uh, need that we currently have. And it actually sort of uh, uh, confirms what has been shown in the uh, mixed mix survey. So you see that for 0 to 4 years, 5 to 19, 10 to 14, uh, and you look at the uh, the zero protection index uh, from zero to hundred percent. So the more you have the tinge of green, you know, the more you have the coverage, and the less you have that, uh, which is more towards the red and the orange and the yellow in between, uh, the more you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the 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 issue of uh, uh, less uh, uh, coverage in terms of zero protection. So you can see almost across all the age groups, you can say maybe no uh, region as far as the six geopolitical zones are concerned. Uh, you can say it's maybe uh, is in the uh, finishing line per se. You can see some tinge of uh, green, you know, around, uh, you know, states in uh, KB and uh, Sokoto, and then also uh, certainly in some southern states here, you can see some of that. But certainly as far as uh, the dominant color is concerned here uh, in this, uh, uh, in this um, uh, uh, picture, it is that it's largely reddish, yellowish, orangish. And uh, that is the typical picture across all the age groups, across uh, all regions of the country. So a uh, summary of activities that we have been able to do uh, since uh, the confirmation of the outbreak, EOC activation, we developed surveillance and response guidelines, like I mentioned, and then uh, deployment of uh, national rapid responders uh, to states and then technical assistance uh, to these subnational entities, uh, laboratory strengthening at national and subnational uh, levels. Uh, trainings have been done. Supply 
uh, of reagents and consumables, and the lab assessments and optimizations, uh, ongoing efforts also. Uh, also, uh, surveillance. Uh, case definitions are clear, and they are what 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 we use as a tool in currently uh, guiding how we uh, uh, count uh, these uh, numbers that we presented, and then uh, also development of other uh, surveillance tools as uh, it may be required by the surveillance system. Case management and infection prevention and control, uh, provision of uh, DAT to states and healthcare facilities, uh, procurement of IV erythromycin. Uh, it's ongoing. I am happy to report that this has been concluded. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's a hard to come by commodity, especially together with the DAT. All these things had to be procured and sourced from as far back as, uh, or as places as far as Europe. Uh, because I, I will attest to this, I have never throughout my uh, very limited uh, uh, practice in, in, in public health and uh, even in clinical practice, I've never seen uh, parenteral erythromycin or parenteral azithromycin. But it's currently available thanks to uh, diphtheria, I say. And uh, guidelines uh, development uh, is also something that we're able to do. Uh, colleagues on uh, this call and colleagues across uh, NC, uh, some of them are involved or were involved in this uh, guideline development. Healthcare worker infection monitoring, something we continue to uh, also do in this regard. Uh, risk communication, IEC materials, sensitization, webinars, media engagement. All our efforts that uh, you know sort of summarize what has been do what we have been doing, and uh, certainly this does not uh, uh, do justice to all the efforts that are currently being done and those that have been done prior to now. But I felt uh, maybe this would be an important uh, summary that can guide that. So thank you very much uh, for listening to me over the course of this presentation, and I thank. Uh, uh, NC and uh, colleagues on the call uh, for providing the NCDC with this platform uh, to interact with Nigerians, to interact with professionals uh, across the infection control world and uh, also uh, in some uh, different uh, capacities. So thank you and I rest my case. Thank you very much, Dr. Muzamil. It was difficult getting you, but I think it was worth it. Please, can we show him my reactions? It was a wonderful presentation. He has given us didn't hear up me, to date. Yeah, can you hear me? You, you didn't hear what I was saying? No, we heard you. I said it was a wonderful presentation. It was difficult getting you, but it was worth it. <laughs> it was worth it. You know, it was difficult getting you to commit because we know, we understand how busy you are, but it was worth it. You have... Well, I belong, because... so I am an infection control person uh, by by my primary assignment. So diphtheria <laughs> is a, so it's, it's, uh, it's a call, it's a clarion call sort of. So, uh, I, so, so thank you for making the time despite your, your tight um, schedule. So I hope we still have you for a few minutes because questions are still pouring in. Um, Daniel, Igwe, your hand has been up. I think I can give you the floor now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. I mean, Chief Oshuna and Dr. Mozamir. Yes, uh, my some of my questions I had wanted to ask have uh, been uh, taken care of by Dr. Mozamir, even though I see have some aspect there. Now, on the side of uh, Dr. Oshuna, I wanted to know in terms of the after somebody has you no know, after isolation treatment and recovered, is there any post isolation measures that we need to do uh, in that regard? Then uh, to Doctor Muzamil, um, from in fact, really, it's been a very big question on my mind. Like, what has been the cause for you know when you look at the graph? I mean the charts and uh, the graph you showed us is more or less in the north. And uh, you also said 23% were had coverage amongst those that even came down with uh, the diphtheria. So what, what could be the cause of that? Was there any way you were able to do either maybe by um, antibody tests to get to know the concentration, whether these people that were properly vaccinated that actually eventually came down with um, diphtheria. 
And then uh, secondly is looking at also the graph as well, adults got to be infected. So like me now, I'm over 40. Do I need to go and uh, get myself vaccinated again? And uh, if I want to check the level of uh, antibody I have in my system now, is there any place where I could do that? Probably um, established by NCDC and all that. Then and my next other question is, now you've seen it's more in the north and uh, the problem is there. So what is there? What level of um, acceptance? Because I was so much, uh, I mean, interested, like when I looked at the vaccination coverage and then in the north is almost zero in terms of diphtheria. And I was like, what's the level of acceptance right now in the north to this very vaccination regarding diphtheria? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Igwe, for your questions. Um, Dr. Muzamil, are you still with us? Is it there? Yeah, I'm here. Is okay. it for? Yes, Igwe yeah. has given you a lot of questions. Yeah, you, uh... you, you can respond while I check whether Dr. Shun is still with us. Okay, so I will I will uh, try and do justice to some of what he mentioned. I think uh, there was uh, the issue of um, uh, uh, what he said. Yeah, why why the the why is it in the north or something? Is that what he said? Or what has been the major? Why driver? most of the cases are in the north, and that he can see that coverage is zero. So what is being done to? Um, address that. I think the, the main part of my presentation, if you followed closely, you would have seen that uh, uh, is, is where I took time to actually reiterate some of those efforts. The the first part was largely academic. I'm sure in Dr. Oshun's presentation, he, he, he adequately covered that, you know, uh, but the main difference is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the current situation. And uh, it's, 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 it's a problem to do with vaccination, like I mentioned. It's a tap, you know? So it's a tap. You need to close the tap. And that tap is that uh, you need to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, uh, eligible children are vaccinated as they should be. And then uh, also access is provided as far as, uh, you know, uh, policy is concerned. So if you manage to uh, uh, make a, or improve accessibility to these vaccines, and then you engage community, and then uh, certainly uh, uh, the, the, the people uh, are adequately mobilized and then uh, they take the vaccine, it, it will be over. It's largely a vaccine problem. You know, it's nothing that requires one hard thinking or uh, one, uh, what do you call it? It's just a vaccine problem. So once we are able um, to close that gap, the cases will stop coming. So um, on why it's uh, like that is because the coverage has been low. So if you look at the data, if you closely follow the, uh, if you check the last mix even that was done, you will see the vaccination coverage. And some of the surveillance, seroprevalence surveys that have been done are like the NAIS. So you can closely look at it and it will show you the seroprotection. But as far as the vulnerability of states is concerned, I, I, I think uh, that you are reporting cases doesn't mean you are the only one with the problem. You know, yes. uh, there are the silent states. So those silent states also will continue to uh, optimize their surveillance system and then continue to engage stakeholders to enhance surveillance and intensify surveillance activities so that uh, we are able to uh, pick these cases. That uh, they are not reporting doesn't mean the cases are not there. So it's, uh, it's just something I, I also want to uh, put in context. Uh, but um, regarding, I think, uh, where you can get tested for serial protection, uh, I'm not sure. This was done for research purposes. <laughs> so I think you may have to check with your NHS or so, or NHIS, as the name is called, and uh, see whether they could actually do that for you. I, I'm not sure, sir. Thank you. Can I can I just say something? Can I just chip in for Dr. Igwe? I want to say that apart from immunization coverage, he mentioned that even a half of those that were fully immunized, half of the cases that were reported, 
you know, were, were fully immunized. And I think the issue, apart from just immunizing, how were the vaccines stored? Because if the, if the cold chain is broken, Dr. Oshun told us it should be to eight, uh, the storage temperature. If there's any break in the storage of the vaccines, even though you're fully vaccinated, it will still come down. So it means that the system, that this is where we're talking about health system strengthening. It's not just us talking IPC and putting things in place, but it's got to be properly done. I, I'm so interested in this because in my days in the medical school, we never saw any case. But you know, that was then. But you know, we now have a lot of uh, issues. And like he says, surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. The fact that it's not being reported, that was uh, one or two cases reported in Luz. I saw Luz on that map. And you know, there's a lot of movement in this country. So we shouldn't rest on our words as IPC practitioners because it can spring up anywhere. Because people move around. People move around and you do, especially in the community, yeah, rural okay. areas. So let us be all ears and be mm -hmm. ready to pick it up. My small contribution, over and out. Uh, thank you, Ma, for that um, contribution. So the important thing is that you might be vaccinated but may not have developed immunity if some other issues with the vaccine storage or code or probably poor technique of vaccination too so um there's a question here thank you dr shu and dr muzamil is there a survey for 2023 with regards to the optic of the vaccine if yes is there an improvement from the previous survey and what has been done to improve uptake thank you Dr. Muzami, are you still with us? Ah, ma, I'm here. Okay. So, um, uh, last mix was done 2022, but uh, mix is, is a population-based survey. But mm. uh, the seroprevalence survey, the last time it was done, uh, like I mentioned, is for NICE, the National Aid Indicator Survey. So, uh, I that one was 2017-18 or 18 thereabout. Uh, thereafter, I'm not aware any seroprevalence survey was done. I think there was one for COVID, uh, but I'm not sure thereafter uh, anyone was done for any of the antibodies. So I I know they're expensive and they require a lot of effort, planning, and whatever. But uh, the ones you mentioned in terms of mix and stuff, those are population-based surveys, and uh, those are available. I think the last one is 2021 or 2022. Yeah, so you can you can just uh, freely look for it on Google. You see that, uh, or go to NPHCDA. Uh, sorry, not NPHCDA. Uh, I think it's NPC National Population Commission uh, together with NPHCDA and other stakeholders. They are the ones who coordinate the uh, the the uh, mix. Mix is a multiple indicator cluster survey. Thank you. Thank you very much. So surveys are expensive. Why well, I think for those in Kanu, a lot of, um, just as Dr. Muzamil mentioned, there's a lot of advocacy in trying to get people to accept the vaccine. Most of us are aware that after the COVID outbreak, the hesitancy towards vaccination even worsened. So on our own front, let us look at what we can do to improve people's acceptance of vaccination because this is just a clear case. If you look at the maps he showed us, you could see the reverse when it came to vaccination and the reverse when it came to cases of diphtheria occurring. And there was a question, Dr. Shun, are you still with us? There was a question for you earlier. Dr. Shun, are you still with us? Okay, he had said he was having a meeting, but someone was asking about the side effects of um, the vaccine and how long does it last? Most mothers and healthcare professionals will tell you that for the pentavalent vaccine or even the DPT. Okay, I'm still here. Okay. So did you get the question? No. Okay, someone was asking how long does the side effects of the vaccine last? Which side effects? 
you know, my network went off, so I can't see the question anymore, but that was because I had read it earlier, side effects of the vaccination. Side effects are few. Uh, I know mm -hmm. that most of the side effects are reactions at the it's that's not common in students. And so the the vaccine that is given as booster dose is a bit different from the one given the DPT. So for booster doses, especially the ones from four years above and above, uh, it contains only tetanus and diphtheria. The uh, concentration is a little lower than what is in the um, the DPT because the the, the old, older children and adolescents um, have more reactions than the um, infants and the toddlers. Secondly, what was the second question? So the back is safe. Uh, like I mentioned, says it's up to 23 months. The, sec the first booster dose, that's the second year of life. Uh, four to seven years for the second booster dose. And um, you should take at least about six doses. Some say seven doses throughout life. I don't know whether there's booster dose in our MPI, in our national yeah. organization. I know we do the three. Uh, first three doses, but I'm not sure about the booster doses uh, in our own MPI. And of course, cost is also part of it uh, for the government. So the more, the merrier. So the more the booster doses, the greater the protection. And I mentioned earlier that at 0 0.01, which is the, which gives you full protection, it does not confer um, long-term immunity. Long-term immunity would be when you have 1.0 and above. That will give you long-term immunity. But the 0 0.01 will give you full protection, but of course, it's not long-term. And long-term can will be in maybe three to five years or a little more than that. I'm uh, sorry, the full protection will be about three to five years or more, but definitely not 10, 20, 30 years. Thank you, Doctor so Oshun. Was asking. Sorry, Doctor Oshun. Somebody, Doctor Igwe was asking that can he check his own antibodies level? Do you know where this can be done? <laughs> well, we know so academically. You, can, you, you, cannot check. you cannot check. That is a highly sophisticated <laughs> test. Yeah. So you, it, it's done in the research setting. It's not a exactly. test that is done routinely. It's not like rubella, or it's not like rubella or hepatitis B surface and uh, hepatitis B immunity. Uh, this one is a bit uh, more technical in terms of the test method because this one is toxin, so you need to be able to measure the antibody to the antitoxin. Uh, so it's a bit more technical than the rubella or hepatitis B surface antigen antibody testing. Sorry, uh, John, Dr. John. I know the discussion is going on, but as we are discussing, people should remember to give us feedback on these very interesting uh, topics from our two erudite speakers. And I think I want to even have the recording so we can listen to it and share the word. Because we, I know we're very few of this on this um, on this call, but this is something that needs to go viral, you know, because nobody is safe. No, and the babies are not safe. What can we do? Because that is calling for answers. Why is immunization? Why were we free for 10 years and then suddenly it's coming up? We need to, this is our own local Nigerian problem. We need to find out why and be able to correct it. Over to you, over and out. Thank you very much. You can, everyone, please, can you make out time to complete the feedback form? It has been posted in the chat. Then um, while we are doing that, Somebody says his question is, 
Has all the interventions provided resulted in any significant reduction in the occurrence of cases? Dr. Muzami, are you still with us? I actually, I can't see him, but if when you, if you look at the the chat he showed us, the last ones he showed us with the epi weeks, you can see that from week 31 to 32 to 30, 31 to 32, the peak was at 32 weeks, the cases are still declining. The, the chart was on a downward trend. So let us just hope that it will be sustained to the points we had it pre this outbreak where we did not have cases reported at all. So I think from that we can infer that some of the interventions are yielding fruit. Sorry, Dr. John, uh, was there anything for me? Oh, Apologies. Okay. I have to go up. <laughs> All right. Someone mm, was anything asking. For me? Yes. Mm. Someone was asking if the interventions put in place so far was EOC. having any impact. Sorry, ma. Go ahead. If the interventions put in place so mm. far was having any impact. Yeah, I think one of the slides showed that, right? Yeah, yes. Sure? Yes, mm -hmm. I was sure when we introduced yes. DAT, mm -hmm. the case management outcomes improved. Mm -hmm. Um yes. what just some I I have a question. You, oh, you know this is something that is just coming on. We are developing new guidelines. So do you are you circulating these guidelines to all the states? And when you have guidelines, do you have guidelines for the health facility? Do you have guidelines for the community? Because this is not this uh it's multi-sectorial, stakeholders. The community have to be involved. They need to be told the case fatality. I noticed that you say it's 5.5%. Uh, well, our, 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 uh, the book says it's five to 10%. So at least we are not at the peak, it's not 10%. We need to bring it down. So is there guidelines? And can you, are you going to share those guidelines with your colleagues? So Thank that- Thank you very much, Ma. Yes. Mm. So, um, like you rightly mentioned, uh, we do a human-centered approach in all our interventions. And there is nothing we develop without the target end users. That is to say, uh, in this regard, uh, the healthcare facilities, uh, the case managers, the facility IPC focal persons, and certainly the DSNOs, uh, who are representatives of the surveillance system, but they, they sort of operate at the community level. And they provide an important linkage between what happens in the facility and what happens in the community. So all these guidelines were developed uh, uh, sort of uh, with them, uh, with the state epidemiologists also, and then uh, experts in uh, uh, pediatrics, ID, clinical microbiology, all of it. Dr. John show so a component of the uh, guideline, actually. So it, it's not just guideline for IPC or for vaccination. Mm -mm. It's, it's, it's surveillance and response guideline. So it's a compendium of all uh, the necessary standards and uh, uh, sort of uh, practices that uh, will keep one safe or the system safe uh, as far as the uh, 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 public health system is concerned. That is uh, vaccination, laboratory, case management, infection prevention and control, and uh, also uh, uh, coordination. So all those things, and also uh, um, uh, some key performance indicators that uh, people could use in actually uh, gauging their response or their uh, progress uh, as far as the response activities are concerned. So that's the that's sort of what is in the in the guideline. So it's a compendium of all of this. So even the IPC component uh, uh, of the guideline was reviewed by some of the Orange Network uh, uh, focal persons who are end users at the facility level. So yes, ma, like you rightly mentioned, we do that. And uh, we do that with them in mind. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Mozamil. There was also a question. I think this is the last question we can take because our time is far gone. Someone asked whether the current upsurge is due to economic hardship since people greater than the target age of five years are coming down with the disease. What's your opinion on this, sir? So uh, like I alluded in my presentation, certainly we need to, uh, all people here are scientific people. 
And uh, also we have a scientific mind in our approach. So it then means that uh, in some way, we will have to contribute to the knowledge gap. So again, this is an interesting something you can look out for on why it's happening. And uh, like I mentioned, the whole world is looking out to us, so looking up to us to actually um, uh, provide uh, the necessary guidance in terms of knowledge, you know, uh, uh, for diphtheria. Uh, and um, it could be, certainly you could argue that, uh, but certainly I think the only answer that will uh, uh, sort of clarify everything is uh, when you do some, some research. Uh, so the research could be either at community level or even uh, at uh, individual level where you're able to uh, take some samples and then see how you do that. So, um, but um, uh, in, in, in its entirety, it's not surprising. Uh, even prior to now, I, I, I never came across uh, where it stated outright that uh, adults can't have diphtheria. Of course, it's largely predominant in children, but adults also could have that. And then uh, it's for a number of these uh, multiple reasons, some of which you, you alluded to them. So, um, and uh, I, I think we also try to show association between uh, why uh, once you are older than 15, uh, there was a difference in terms of a number of cases uh, be between uh, 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 men and women or between females and males. And um, that is uh, also shown because most of the carers for the children are women. So you tend to have that. Uh, and then uh, with increased exposure, of course, uh, that is how that is able to happen. So I, I, I put it to you that uh, we, we don't know everything uh, in this space, certainly, uh, in terms of what the data could, could say or could guide. But uh, we do know what we know. And um, uh, we are always open to collaborating in that regard to see that uh, we learn more things about uh, the current ongoing outbreak. Thank you. So thank you very much for that. So the, the board is in our courts as scientists, as researchers, as healthcare providers, as IPC professionals, which can see how we can bring something good out of this dark lining, this outbreak that is ongoing by conducting research that can answer some of these gray areas we have now. So any last words from you, Dr. Muzamil, and then Dr. Oshun, before we call it a day? So since my chief went first earlier, let me go first now. So um, thank you very much. Uh, first is to express sincere appreciation for uh, all that has been done. Uh, at NC, certainly we like the uh, new uh, sort of ginger in terms of activity, in terms of waking up people, uh, eye infection control people to wake up to their responsibility. And CDC now, you know, CDC. Yeah. So um, there is that also. So we, we are appreciative as an organization to, uh, to NSIC for this collaboration to deliver on this. And uh, also I want to uh, put it out there that uh, this is a whole of society response. So it's not an NCDC response. Uh, diphtheria certainly is not an NPSCDA exclusive activity also. So it is a whole of society response. Uh, we have to chip in in the way we can, uh, be it in uh, uh, you know uh, enlightening more people or sensitizing more people about the importance of vaccination. And then um, also uh, 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 late presentation of cases is also a problem. So how can people present early when they have uh, 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 some of the symptoms that defies uh, uh, diphtheria. So it's, it's important that we understand the whole of community approach or whole of society response approach because only then we'll be able to truly take ownership of some of these community-based activities. And uh, uh, we are grateful to also uh, other stakeholders that stayed on the call uh, and add invaluable questions and inputs into this. And thank you very much for their time. So over and Thank you. Is Dr. Shun still with us? I know he mentioned he had a meeting earlier. I can't see him on the call anymore. But we thank, we are very grateful to him and Dr. Muzamil, our erudite scholars for today, for a wonderful presentation and for giving us pertinent information as healthcare workers and IPC 
practitioners. Dr. Shuande, any last words before we close? Please remember to complete the feedback form in the chat. Thank you all. Dr. Shuande, any last words before we call it a day? Um, I know the day is fast spent, but I want to thank everybody that make out time to be on this. Uh, because like I said earlier, this is a Nigerian problem. Uh, we don't know whether it's in the other uh, sub-region uh, in West Africa, but we need to, now we have uh, IPC practitioners and we should work and make sure that we have updates and make sure we nip it so it will be recorded just like we did for Ebola, that we'll continue to work along that line, Ebola and COVID, to make sure that we contain this, uh, this, and like I said, it's got to be multi-sectorial. We cannot do it all alone. It's not just the NGOs. Uh, everybody, uh, Dr. Mozabi has told us that MPACD, everybody is involved. But we should be all out and make sure that surveillance, our surveillance is strong. So in case you have one or two cases, you really pick it up and isolate. We have everything we need on this call. And I want to promise that the recording of this uh, will be shared in case you want to share it at your IPC meeting or even uh, your grand round so everybody will have more people getting this information. Thank you all very much. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you all. We thank you for making it a date with us and we hope you'll be with us last Thursday of the month of October. Please, gentle reminder, complete the feedback form. So thank you all for your time and patience. Having stayed, we've gone beyond our time. But I can see it was quite interesting. So goodbye. See you next, last Thursday of the month of October. Thank you, ma'am. Goodbye. Thank you, Babadi. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Igwe. Igwe is worried. Don't worry, Daria. <laughs> yeah, we'll give you, we'll give you booster dose. We'll give I want booster do. dose for me. We'll give you booster <laughs> dose for free. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor Adesanya. Yeah, I can recognize your voice. Just remember transmission-based precautions, because nobody mm. knows he's fully immunized. So transmission-based in precautions. He, he said droplets, airborne, and contact. So all yes. the things that you've learned. Everything has to come into fear. I, I think this is very fear. good, very good, very good reminder. Thank you very much, Dr. John. Thank you, ma'am. What is the next? I, I see, I look at the curriculum. I think what you have next month is care, uh, the IPC care bundles. We need to start streamlining it and getting, because we need to upload at least one month ahead to advertise. Because I'm just thinking, why do we have so few people on this call? Hmm? Hello? She's gone. Mike, I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. I can hear you. Yeah, I'm just saying yes, maybe. I, can hear you. I think we will discuss that offline, Ma. <laughs> okay, we will, we will do that. We'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. comment from Nurat Adenike Suleiman. Yes, that's true. I think the cold chain is one. Very importantly, this issue of um, 
vaccine hesitancy. People no longer want to get vaccinated. They've believed all the stories on on social media about what the vaccine or what vaccines do. Please try and fill the feedback form so we can use that as a link to ensure that we share the presentations. Okay. And thank you all for waiting to the very end. Ma, can we end the meeting now? I don't know whether I started it or Lake on it. I don't know. Okay, Lake on. Wait, I will end it. Let me see if I can end it. Okay, ma. Thank you, ma.